Okay, let's welcome you again. Hello to this week's A Drink with the Idler. I'm Victoria Hull. I'm the director of the event side of the Idler and our online events are called A Drink with the Idler. Um, now Idler TV, which you can catch up on, on YouTube. You can see all of our drinks with the Idler there. So you can check that out later. Um, we're also live streaming on Facebook. Get your friends along. We, it's really interactive. We love you asking questions. Send questions to me during the conversation. We've got Simon, the, the person you're all here for, Simon Farnaby, who Tom will introduce in a second. They'll be having a conversation. That's Tom Hodgkinson, the editor of The Idler. For those of you who don't know so much about us, the Idler is a magazine and also an academy with online courses. So here it is. It there it is. So I'm showing it to you. Um, so welcome to you all. What do I need to say? The most important thing this week is that we've got Mark Vernon back. Lot, you all missed him last week. And for those of you who haven't been before, every week since lockdown, Mark has been sharing some philosophy with us as we uh, start a drink with the idler and his wisdom and his intelligence has been inspiring us all. So it's really just for me to say welcome to Mark and to Simon and Mark. What have you been thinking about this week? Well, um, there's a couple of cues, actually. One is, I know Simon's going to be talking about his new book, at least I hope he is, um, because it features purgatory. And in fact, just today, I've signed a book contract to write a guide to Dante's Divine Comedy, which will be out next year for the 700th anniversary of Dante's death in September. And so that was a nice little link, and it also gives me an excuse to give a little plug. Um, but uh, uh, I wanted to pick up really the thread of humour um, because that's certainly part of um, Simon's repertoire. In fact, I'm friendly with um, an improviser called Pippa Evans, and when I was speaking to her earlier, she said that her first proper gig, Simon, had been with you somehow. I, I can't quite remember the details now, but uh, she wanted to wish you um, farewell, f fair, fair winds for this evening. Oh, um, lovely. Yeah, I remember. I remember she sort of plays, she does a lot of comedy songs as well as stand-up, doesn't she? Yeah, she's brilliant. Yeah. They did the most amazing show called Showstoppers, actually, um, which is an improvised musical. It's quite astonishing. Anyway, look, humour, because um, it's, it's a really fascinating subject with a, a, a tremendous history, actually. That's one way to pick it up. Um, the word humour as we now use it, it's relatively modern. It only really took on that sense as wit, um, comedy and so on in the 17th century. Um, and because before it had been associated with the humours, with your temperament, these kind of bodily fluids that needs to be in balance so that you weren't melancholic or you weren't choleric or you weren't too sanguine, um, that sense of it. Um, and so it's, it's very fascinating um, to ask why it changed to the modern sense of humour. And um, for regulars to idler drinks, you'll know that when in doubt, I turn to this figure I'm very keen on called Owen Barfield, um, the inspiration behind the Inklings, behind Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. And Barfield was very interested in the way words change and why they change. And he thought that um, humour had taken on its modern meaning because in a way, our sense of ourselves had withdrawn from the world around us um, to be experienced primarily from within us. Um, so before the 17th century, it wasn't just that the humours flowed for our body, but the humours that, that we experienced flowing for our body were connected to the world around us. Um, they were connected to the planets, for example. Um, I wanted to give a little plug as well for Mars this month. Planet Mars is looking absolutely amazing in the sky this month, um, rising quite soon after it gets dark, um, a bright red or pink light in the sky. Um, and Mars was felt, of course, to fill us with the humours to do with, well, combat. Um, that wasn't just warfare, actually, but was also um, sort of improving ourselves, how we kind of need to work on ourselves. And part of that is a kind of self-combat. Um, so you might turn to the humour of Mars in order to bring that into yourself. It's influence. Again, the word influence comes from this astrology, the inflow of the Martian spirit. 
um, along with others. Um, but we've lost that sense now for the large part. Um, I mean, some people um, work at it still and see what they can recover. But I guess for many people, um, that's gone. And maybe it's even regarded as somewhat superstitious or ridiculous, incomprehensible. Um, but the idea, Barfield said, is that we now look for things like humour um, in, in our personal interactions. And so in particular, humour narrowed. And we look for it now to give us this sense of the sanguine or the jovial um, previously, we might have turned to Jupiter for that, but now we turn to co comedians. Um, so, Simon, uh, you're a bit of a Jupiter stand-in for us this evening. Um, it's interesting, actually, that at the same time as um, humour being coined in this way, changing in this way, um, Barfield um, noticed that we've given humour to the rest of the world, actually. He noticed that in many, many languages, the modern sense of humour is the English word. Um, along with other words that are related, like cant and humbug. Um, apparently, they're very, those words are very similar across many different languages. It's one of our English, if not British, gifts to the world. Um, I want to just, to just to add a final thought, though, to bring it into philosophy, because um, another, the person who changed the word, who started using it in this modern sense, first of all, was a chap called Anthony Ashley Cooper, who was the third Earl of Shaftesbury. And in the 17th and 18th century, he was actually the best known British thinker, um, right around Europe, in fact. Um, he's a bit of a niche interest now, um, but I've become very interested in recently. I wrote about him in my slot in the Idler magazine um, a couple of um, issues back. Um, but he um, got onto this new sense and started to use it because he felt that the modern world needs humour in quite a particular sense. He thought that we need it in the sense of its wit, um, because the great thing about humour is that not just it makes us laugh, but it, when it's used well, it can ease us up. It can leave us sort of open to things. Um, it can help dialogue, for example. It can help us understand people who are different from us. And he thought, he linked that to this word wit. Um, again, in this dual sense, not just meaning funny, but also meaning kind of smart. You know, someone who has wit and knows what's going on a bit more than someone who doesn't. Um, and, so, and so I wanted to bring that sense of, of humour in too. Um, he noticed, for example, that Socrates um, was very able to tolerate even ridicule, in fact. Um, uh, be, the, the, the other, the great comic of the ancient world, Aristophanes, uh, made a living in part out of, of ridiculing Socrates. The idea of having your head in the clouds is actually Aristophanes' coinage, because um, he said that Socrates has his head in the clouds. Um, but what's so interesting about Socrates is not only did he not mind, but he related to that um, and thought, you know, what has Aristophanes got to tell me, in fact, um, in his um, witty repartee? So I don't just feel ridiculed, but might learn something from it. And the great thing about that is that starts to reconnect you with people around you. Um, and so in some ways, and I wonder whether humour is necessary now, not just because it gives us a break and can help us laugh, but because it actually can, when it's used well, it can actually help us to connect with others um, and maybe even start to connect with the world around us, maybe just gaining some sort of sense of this older sense of the humours that were an inflow as much as something that we projected out. Um, because, you know, you don't need me to say that we're living in quite fragmented times um, and perhaps humour can help us with that in all this sort of rich sense that it can mean. Tom. You need to unmute. Tech problems as usual. Well, thanks, Mark. And I think that's really true that humour can make you feel essentially much less alone. Um, and that's certainly the case with Simon's stuff. I mean, we know him, uh, I suppose, first from things like Horrible Histories, which is hilarious and educational. Um, you may or may not also know that he uh, was involved in the writing of Paddington 1 and co-wrote Paddington 2 with Paul King. And that was a massive success. And that's led on to all sorts of other amazing projects, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, he's also in The Detectorist, which is, um, you know, sort of daft and funny. Uh, and most recently, the, there's been a second series of Ghosts, which is just absolutely hilarious. It's like a sort of band of <coughs> wandering players. Um, uh, it has a sort of Shakespearean vibe because it's this large collection of characters or like a sort of Canterbury Pilgrims or something like that. And uh, up in his workroom, 
next door to a poster for his new book is the man who did it all. Hi, Si. Hi. I'm sorry about this um, uh, thing I've got behind me, this banner. I mean, it's entirely unnecessary, isn't it? Well, but it's really, slightly vulgar, Mark, kind of self-promotion. Really Mark, we, are, we are here to talk about this book, though, which I, I, uh, I've been reading. Um, can you tell us a little bit about it? It, it has a sort of purgatorial theme. Well, the, uh, it's, it's about a wizard. Well, he's a warlock, originally, from the 6th century. So he's from the Dark Ages. I thought I'd write about the Dark Ages because no one knows that much about it. I don't think, or at least I don't. I mean, I think that's why it's called the Dark Ages, right? Uh, well, there's a, there's a new book out called The Light Ages, which sort of um, slightly pours cold water on that theory. It was quite, oh. quite a lovely period, but yeah, carry on. Aren't we in the light ages now? Like, we can see everything now, can't we? Well, that's what some people think, but others think we may have actually gone backwards. Uh, <laughs> so he's, um, yeah, so, but he's very mischievous and, and uh, sort of wicked. And so he gets banned from... Uh, he gets sentenced to purgatory, to spend 10 years in purgatory, uh, which I don't even know is possible. Mark might, might be able to tell me. But um, in, in my book, it is. <laughs> but, in, but instead of being sent to purgatory, um, his enemy, uh, Jeroboa, uh, named after the boot shop, uh, Jeroboam's, um, he, uh, <laughs> he sends Murdin uh, into the rivers of time, instead of the rivers of purgatory. So Murdin ends up in a place we call Bashingford. Um, and it, wasn't, it wasn't originally called Bashingford, was it? We were talking it, about this, it was, this a bit um, earlier. Well, it was called Basingstoke, but I, was, I wasn't allowed <laughs> to insult the people of Basingstoke. You weren't you allowed know, to by a, a sort of committee at the publishing company. Yeah, well, it was really meant to be, um, uh, you know, I, I actually love Basingstoke and I've got a lot of affection for it. And, and I put in all these things like Basingstoke has the most roundabouts of any city in Europe, which is true. And I think they should be proud of it. And they all have names and some of them have nice ornaments on and flowers. And I, it actually treats Basingstoke pretty well. But no, you're not allowed. A lot of things happen like this. I mean, this is going off topic, but I was doing something recently and, and uh, the mom character, I went, we have to look at the mom character in your story because we've shown the script to our group of moms and they disapproved so there's now groups of people who if they go you know they get offended you have to change it so anyway so, 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 need... so you, you you could you could do a, a piece about well let's say your character in ghosts who is a sort of disgraced tory mp called julian um in the yeah, you could go with we've shown this to mps a group of mps oh, they don't like it it's not a fair reflection of, uh, of MPs, <laughs> or oh, certainly not since the early 90s. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Well, that's, mean, the, that's the good thing about ghosts, is because they can't actually get together a sort of um, uh, a committee of serving wages from 1704. Exactly, yeah. But it's, what, it's a bit like what Mark was saying earlier. It's strange, with, with humour, you have to call upon types. And it's really hard to sort of not offend anybody because you go, you're looking at types of, I mean, Alan Partridge is a type of sort of sports caster or, you know, so they are types and you, so you're generalizing for people to go, oh, that's interesting. I know someone like that. All right. But, but then they also going, oh, you can't generalize. <laughs> so it's quite, it's quite a tough line to sort of, to walk. Um, but anyway, uh, where were we? Oh, so well, no, Basingstoke, offending people from Basingstoke, that's where we were. So, 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 so Basingstoke had to be changed. Um, yes, yeah, so he arrives in... He but, arrives, but, but Basingstoke is not actually a, a human being, is it? I mean, there isn't a, like a sort of collection of Basingstokes he got together. Isn't it a bit different? I mean, that, that's going a little bit far, isn't it? We, we yeah, did like, a book called Crap Towns, which had Basingstoke in it, and, you know, we just bunged it in as a crap town. So if you go, we've shown the book to our group of small English towns. <laughs> and eight out of ten of them were offended. Uh, <laughs> I know, but I suppose it's the people who live. Anyway, anyway um, Murdin arrives in, in uh, Bashingford, as we call it. But he, I mean, that was sort of the joke because he thinks he's in hell, you know. So he's going, what hell is this? And there's 
there's planes and there's cars and everyone's staring into these little black boxes. And um, uh, so he thinks he's in hell. Then he realizes he's in the future. And so he's, he tries to get back home and he, and he meets a girl, a 12 year old girl called Rose who wants to be famous, you know, wants to win a singing competition. So they, they, they have a sort of deal, which is the thrust of the narrative where she, she wants a singing spell. To, to win her singing competition and he wants to get home and and so so she's going to use her modern wiles and you know she knows what a car is and what a what a smartphone is and and um so she's going to help him get home and it's all about their sort of unlikely friendship and and it's a bit about nature as well and you know um and and about sort of the magic of nature, I suppose I was I was trying. Yes, yeah, so, so what are you trying to get across with it? Because I know you, you when we've done interviews before, Simon, you said that you know uh, a good book or a good film really has a sort of philosophical idea at the heart of it. Um, yeah. And we can talk about that with you know some of the work you've done. What, what was the sort of idea that you want to get? And and your work, as we said, is actually very gentle and funny and silly. Um, it, it doesn't offend people and it, it does show that you can do really funny comedy without you know um treading on stereotypes i suppose but what, yeah. so what, what, what were you trying to get across in in um the wizard book well this one really has a message that we are all one you know that nature we are nature and we we do get or we are a little divorced from nature and and it's it's quite poignant now where we're sort of I don't know, we're sort of stuck in, it, it, it's a, there's a duality now where we're partly stuck in houses and we're partly connecting with nature again because there's nothing else to do while we're going to park. So we're doing things that we wouldn't normally do because of busy lives. So it's, I've found it a real, I don't know how you found it, but it's a real sort of dichotomy, isn't it? There's sort of, there's two sides to all of it. There's really good things and there's really bad things. Yeah, it's, it's sort of mixed, isn't it? And you live uh, fairly near Hampstead Heath with your um, your wife, your daughter, and, and your dog. So I imagine you, you've been getting out there fairly frequently. We get out there quite a lot. But I wanted to say in the in the book, like really, like there's some kids in the book, and they go, they're going, you know, we're you know we're really woke to the environment, and we're we're sort of so, and and Murdin's, Murdin sort of can't believe that everyone's so divorced from nature. They don't know what how many different types of grasses there are in a sort of, you know, a, a 20 meter radius. He's going, how many types of grasses are there? And they're going, I don't know, two. And he's going, there's 137. Uh, you know, and so he's appalled that they don't know these things. And they're going, listen, we know all about the rainforest and, and whales. And he's going, yeah, but what about the grass on your feet and the flowers and the trees? And, you know, um, what's a horse chestnut? What's a hawthorn bush? And, what's its history and what does it do and you know um and all these plants when you look into them like even bearded darnell which is quite a boring you know you see it in it'll be by your bins in the you know at the front of your house or the back or whatever and that that was known as um false booze so it was called false wine because if you ate a lot of it it would mimic the effects of alcohol so people used to boil it up and and, and drinking it tasted foul, but you would get pissed, you know. So um, I really wanted to, get, and then and then really through through that sort of those mundane bits of nature, I wanted to go. We're all sort of connected. It sprouts, and and of course because it spans time. So that, so he's from the dark ages and Rose is from the future. But and they clash at first, but then they realise they have a lot in common. Um, and so really, it was going. We, we're we're all one and have been through time and let's not get too far apart from each other and, and nature. That's a very beautiful message. Well, thank you. Now, what about um, Paddington 1 and Paddington 2? Because, I mean, you're trying to get something across there as well, aren't you? Well, that was... I mean, 2 was sort of the power of... the power of kindness, really, I suppose. And we put him up against Hugh Grant, who was sort of all about himself and about self-aggrandizement and Paddington was all about helping out his neighbors and you know he he came good in the end because he was just by his nature he was kind to people and and he got his sort of dream which was to get which was to see his Aunt Lucy or to get his Aunt Lucy a present so um yeah that was um 
that that's what was at the, the heart of that i think uh, is it difficult to get a i hear that making a film is one of the most difficult things you could possibly do now how, how did you and paul manage to get paddington and paddington 2 actually made i mean it seems almost miraculous not only to get a film made but to get a very good film made and also to get a very good film seen by lots of people well, I mean, Paddington has the obvious thing, which is that it's a very well-loved book, you know. So, although I think there'd been various versions that had failed, and I think there was a Postman Pat film that was around at the same time that 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 everyone thought would do really well and sort of didn't do that well. So, it's harder to get films like um, like Mindhorn, which came out the same year as Paddington Two, and. Mindhorn was seen by about 12 people and... Well, but, 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 but Mindhorn is, yeah. <laughs> and Mindhorn, it, it is, you know, it is, it's also excellent. I mean, it's a, it's a brilliant film. Oh, thanks very much. Yeah, but that had a... That was harder because everyone went, Mindhorn, what, what's, what's that? I've never heard of it. It's quite hard to get people... That's my everyman. That's my everyman voice, by the way. Well, we'd like to hear some of your voices later some of the, uh, the chat people are already clamoring for and I, I know you get this at service stations people coming up to you and asking you to perform do the for dance you. yeah i got that in wh smith do the dance and i went what dance and he went the stupid deaf dance you know stupid deaf stupid you know they all do that and i refused to do it and then a little boy cried and then her dad went see that look what you've done to him Paul, it made him cry. And I was like, you know, I had this shopping and I was like, oh my God. Does that happen a lot? So you're, you're called upon to do a sort of, um, if you like, gratis performance, one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, I, I get a lot of, um, um, I, get, I get a lot of, will you do a video thing for my kids? And because it's kids, you usually go, yeah. But um, Julian Barrett, who I did Mind Home with and from the Boosh, uh, always refuses to do them. And he, and he always says to them, uh, you know, uh, the Chinese say that every, photo, every time a photograph's taken of you, it steals a piece of your soul. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly the fans sort of, their faces drop and they go off like really miserable. Well, he, he's quite a gloomy person uh, <laughs> in reality. I mean, a, a lot of comedians are quite gloomy personages, aren't they? Because they sort of, they've seen something negative and that's, actually that's quite funny. Uh, in fact, probably most of them, but it, you seem a bit different. You, you seem generally to be sort of a pretty cheerful person. That's because I'm drunk all the time. Yeah, and when, so and deep when, down when is a... And when I'm not, then I, I get really combative and angry and, and, and sad. <laughs> no, that's not true. Oh, my sister's there. <laughs> Hi. Oh, that's nice. Oh, that's nice. Um, anyway, uh, no, uh, yes, I have tend to have a fairly sunny outlook, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, so getting something off the ground, uh, how, how, how does it actually happen? It, it seems to me like a sort of alchemical process. I can't quite believe that, um, uh, you know, that, that it's sort of possible, really, I suppose. But the, an idea that perhaps you and Paul had in your head, you know, a few years later actually is there. I know it's it's a slight um, it's a slight mystery to me as well actually because the producers there's all various producers and they all they all go, yeah you know the money's falling into place and 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 then and then and then at some point they'll go, yeah this looks like it might not happen, and then you wonder whether to, and then they go oh no hang on carry on keep going, because they find and I don't know where they find it from and film so, it's why it's a bit simpler with a book I quite I quite. It's probably the most fun thing I've done in terms of, because when you're, like you say, in, in, in film, you're reliant on so many aspects, like there's the finance, and then even when you've written the script, there's, there's a director, there's a costume and makeup and wardrobe, and, and then you've got actors who don't look like you imagined, whereas in a book, you're the, you're the director, the costume designer, the lighting person, because you're, you're, really writing a film that people are going to play in their heads and so you sort of are in control of all of it and i only sort of realized that about halfway through 
Because <laughs> I was going, oh, this is like stage directions of the film. You know, he enters the house, there's cobwebs on the ceiling. And then you go, no, I hope the art department put, remember to put cobwebs on the ceiling. And then in the book, I went, oh, no, I don't have to worry about that now because you just go, she walks into a, a room, there's cobwebs on the ceiling, you know. Uh, and then you go, oh, they're there because they're in the, the reader's mind. Yeah, so, so it's quite a satisfying thing. I've heard uh, Bruce Robinson, who wrote with me and I, said something similar about writing a book. You know, it's actually incredibly difficult to write a film. And uh, there's, as you say, there's so many people involved. And it probably ends up being a little bit further away from your original ideas and perhaps would have been ideal. Uh, yeah. But clearly in the book, there's only like one or two other people and you can just sort of do what you want. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Yeah, to Tony Law, there's this comedian Tony Law has got a good joke and he goes, he goes, books are great, aren't they? Unless the acting in your head is shit. <laughs> Which I really like because it's sort of, you forget that, that you're doing it all, you know. You're imagining all these people and all the, and, and everything you're reading, you're imagining. And you sort of really don't give yourself credit for, for that because you're going, oh, I really enjoyed that book. But really, you've, you've played it all out in your imagination and it's, Unless it's all, you know, all the actors are wooden and no one looks right and <laughs> then you start to worry. But that's right. The, the, the reader brings so much more to it because in a sense, in a, in, a, in a movie or TV, you're sort of trapped with the vision that's sort of pumped onto you. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Imposed on you. Um, and then if you, don't well, like, if you don't like one of the actors, you know, you're going, oh, I don't like Tom Hiddleston. And then you go, well, I'm stuck with him now for two hours. Now I've got to look, no, I don't like, I don't, or I don't. <laughs> there's some actors I don't, I have a thing about Jude Law. I, I, I'm sure he's a lovely guy, but I just go, oh, there's Jude Law um, pretending to be someone else. And I can't quite divorce myself. <laughs> um, is Jude here? He's probably here, isn't he? <laughs> I don't think he's here, don't worry. Yeah, carry on. So you can't divorce yourself from what? No, from from uh, from from my. So so it sort of. Well, I suppose it ruins the the film. I suppose. <laughs> Whereas if it's a book, you can go. Oh, I'll imagine someone else, or I'll, you know. Yeah, I'm not going to read a book and keep imagining Jude Law. And that would be ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Some people might enjoy that. They might do. Yeah. Now, what's this? I was reading an interview with you in the Telegraph. Um, yeah. I think it's about it's about the new book. And the headline said, no, I'm not doing, an Simon Farnaby says, no, I'm not doing another Paddington. It would be too much to bear. Yeah. When I read the actual piece, you said, no, I'm not doing another Paddington. It would be too much bear. Yeah. Now, they're very, they're very different things, aren't they? Now, which is it? I'm glad you've picked up on that. And it's very clever of you. Um, not too much to bear. That was his play on it, and a, and a, and a, um, you know, obviously there's a pun there. But no, it was it was too much bear, as it, as in, you know, it takes so long. Like as you say, it takes. It, I think I think Paddington Two was, it was about two years writing, maybe a year and a half. So it's a long time, and then you've got the filming and all the rest of it, and then the publicity. So it's about three years in all, and. The first one was five years in the making because they had the build up and all that, you know, the money's not there and then it is there and all that. So that's eight years of, of thinking about a talking bear. <laughs> and, and then you go, uh, I think I might want to think about a talking guinea pig for a bit, <laughs> which is why I've got a talking guinea pig in the book. But um, do you know, yes, it's just too, because uh, everyone goes, oh, you've got to do Paddington 3. You know, let's go. You gotta do it, mate. Come on. It's my every man. Come on, mate. Come on, mate, gonna do it. You gotta do it. And uh, and I just go and it's yes, it's sort of it's not it's too much to bear. It's it's too much bear in my life. You yeah. have to think about other things sometimes. You, know? you, you, you do think about lots of other things though, don't you? Um, metal collectors and ghosts. Now, yeah. where, where do these ideas come from? Because again, you you've got these Quite, an, quite eccentric concepts, if you like, onto the TV screen. Well, Ghost was, um, Ghost was really, came about because it was a group that did Horrible Histories and then we, we wanted to keep working together. So we did, and we did Yonderland for Sky uh, um, and then 
that finished, then we wanted to do something else. And Ghost was a way of going, doing our favorite things, which is sort of dressing up in, um, you know, costumes, sort of raiding the costume box, <laughs> the, if you like, uh, and playing characters from different eras and ages. Um, and, uh, but, but in a modern setting. So we, we really, I can't remember who said it, but we went, why, why don't we do like dead people? And then we can have a caveman and an army captain and a politician, a modern day politician. Because no one thinks about, if there are ghosts, then there's got to be cavemen ghosts because they did exist. You can't write them out of history. They're always um, sort of Edwardian, aren't they? Or Georgian ghosts. Well, they're always, uh, yeah, or I uh, suppose the classic ghost is which you do have is the Renaissance ghost, the sort of Walter Raleigh. Uh, yeah, and we do have a headless rough. one. You, I know, yeah, you got the headless one, which... Um... But we had a, I mean, my, my one was really, um, uh, I, I have a Tony Blair impression, um, which my sister will know well which try that that i could only do one word of tony blair which is this services services, <laughs> uh, services. uh and so oh i also did nurses nurses you see he has a strange vowel sound on his on his e sound so i got nurses services and um so <laughs> i i wanted to really use this incredible power that i had to, um and then it, and then it turned into you know this sort of character and he's a, but he's a bit sort of um david cameron as well and these gestures you know because they were all told in the early 90s that they weren't allowed to point um politicians by their um spin doctors because pointing would look like you're telling people off and you're prodding them and it's too aggressive it's a bit like the you know we showed our <laughs> we showed your hand gestures to our uh, group of um pointees and they didn't enjoy it. So they went like this. They went, you have to do this so with thumbs. So everyone, you know, Boris is like that. Oh, we, it's going to be so much fun. Brexit's going to be f so great, everybody. He's not doing that anymore, is he? Anyway, um, so uh, <laughs> he did a jump. There was a Boris jump that I did put into my ghost character for the last series. If anyone can spot it. Because when he got the job, you know, that he'd been dreaming for all his life, that is now his worst nightmare. He was leaping, oh, oh, I'm going to have so much energy and it's going to be amazing and we're going to get out of Europe and, and strike trade deals with Australia and have Australian beef. And, um, and he was leaping around and I called it the Boris Hop. So I've got a little Boris Hop in there. Uh, and then there's the point, the Newsnight thumbs. And Cameron was that, he was that, Blair was... So it was a good uh, way of using all, all these um, uh, um, things that I'd noticed, really. About so at, at, at some level, you're noticing these things all the time, and a, a lot of the characters start with a voice. Yeah. Usually it's a voice, because the voice sort of... Strangely, the voice tells you what's going on inside the head in a strange way. So if you have a character who, you know, you know a politician will go, look, 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 look. As soon as you do that, you go, they're trying to get around something. They're trying to, trying to stall and to go, look, 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 no, 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 no. Let me tell you this. Let, let me tell you this. And it, and it sort of, so the outward voice, if you like, informs the, the inward. So you go, oh, that's what he's like, you know. So if you, if you copy, so if you sort of copy those mannerisms, you, you soon sort of it informs the the the, the uh, uh, inner life of the character, if you like. So I always look out for those things, and it's like Mark was saying earlier, you know, about if we all notice these things, as people go, oh, I love the point, and I love the and they're things that you notice, and because I'm looking for things that are funny and uh, in life that people seem that, that I look out for them more. But everyone goes, oh yeah, I noticed that. I know it's that he does that politicians don't they? they do this now and all that and they're always evading the thing you know so and it makes us feel like we're not so alone and you know or, or, exactly or, and it, it's sort of um what often was thought but ne'er so well expressed it, it's something that we've kind of half noticed mm. um but you've sort of fully noticed with your sort of more highly trained um comedic and well i'm not i'm not i sort of am more more I mean, people like Stuart Lee do it very well. And, you know, there's, 
there's comedians that are absolutely amazing at, at that sort of that are noticing those things and bringing them to an, to a to a wide audience and and the great ones are the ones you go oh i thought i was the only one who who thought that you know uh, or noticed that so yeah now philosophically speaking simon just before we go on to questions and maybe from an, an interjection from what and also your own rap which you're going to give us in a moment i'm going to do a rap yeah can i guess uh, can we just sort of wind up this bit by talking about idling philosophy because I have noticed in some of the films, um, there's a sort of praise of doing nothing. You worked on Christopher Robin. Um, yeah. A.M. A. Milne, in fact, we just seen this quote today from an essay he wrote, don't underestimate the value of doing nothing, of just going along, listening to all the things you can't hear and not bothering. I think that was written pre-Poo, so he put some of those ideas into Poo. Yeah. And... You're also working on The Faraway Tree, a, a version of The Faraway Tree, and a, a new thing with Mark Rylance. Um, is it true, as you've said to me confidentially, uh, Simon, that um, you know, you're actually using Hollywood films to communicate idol of philosophy to, to a sort of wider audience? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, it's something that I, I believe in, and, and I think... Um, if I can get it into people's heads in, in by stealth or osmosis or whatever it is, or by laughter, then, then great. Um, I mean, the Christopher Robin uh, film that I've worked on, it's already there in Pooh, you know, Pooh's amazing at that. And Pooh, Pooh's so sort of, and he's not even switched on to his own philosophy. Like he probably sort of couldn't be bothered to think about that too much that's a great thing like Milne really goes for it he goes you know nothing is the very best something so that's naturally there um uh, the Enid Blyton adaptation the faraway tree was really finding because they're quite episodic those Enid Blyton ones and there's some kids and they go up a tree and they have an adventure and they come down but it was written in the 50s so I was going to wanted to set it in modern times and and then there's a natural thing there of going there's a family who move from the city to the country and there's no electricity and there's no they can't charge their phones and their dad's going well i used to play with sticks when i was a kid and i'm going sticks oh my god that sounds so boring and then they go uh, you know and then they go out into the woods and um and lo and behold they find a magical tree that has various lands at the top of them and so that's really about the imagination you know and and um uh and really allowing because i think the dad says it'll only happen when you're bored you know and they're going i hate being bored and he and he goes well that's when it happens so that's sort of when the magic happens which i always think is quite it is a you know it's easy to say the problem with screens and things and kids love them but it's quite hard to get for them to get properly bored and it just is and it's not a failure of parenting i know it because or i hope so because i do it myself you know and my daughter goes i really want to play a game or do you know watch something you, you not always of course you try and limit it but but the fact is it's there and and when it's forced not to be there then it really, then your imagination kicks off. So we've got to find a way of doing that. And that film's, I, I, what, what I try and do is like a, a film or a book is, is have an idea and then it, it's a debate. Again, it's back to, I'm sure Mark will appreciate this. Like you have an idea, you never really have an answer, but the, the, the film or the book gives you a debate about a subject. And so you have characters in a good film, you have all the characters are, are different facets of the debate you know, and they all represent something different or, or approaches to it. So you have an antagonist that believes that work is the only way forward. Usually they're my villains. They're like, work is the way forward. You know, God and Gecko types, you know, greed is good. The harder you're working, the happier you are. And um, that's the sort of, they're the antagonist. And then you've got your heroes who are, I mean, this, this is um, the film. So I wrote a book, uh, this is my first children's book, but I wrote a book called The Phantom of the Open, which is a true story about a crane driver from Barrow, who in 1976 
decided he watched, saw golf on TV for the first time and decided that that was his calling, age 46, never played golf before, ordered a set of clubs from a catalogue, entered the British Open. And in those days, you just had to tick professional and you were in because no one even thought, why would you want to enter the British Open if you weren't a professional? Um, so he got in and played with Jack Nicholas and all those, and, and then shot the worst score ever recorded in the history of major championships, 121, which is a, still a record. Um, and his thing, the, the great thing about that, I read his, he died in 2007, he's called Morris Flitcroft. I mean, that has a similar, it's not really an idler philosophy, but it's a philosophy that it's never too late to put your mind to something. And if you want to master it, you go for it, go for it. You know, no one should really stop you. Um, you know, uh, and he, and he loved golf. Um, and they tried to stop him. They banned him actually from every golf club because they thought they'd humiliated the, the game of golf. The, the, and so they banned him. And then he came back in various disguises. So he came back as a, as a French golfer, Gerard Hoppy. And then he came back as an American. And then they kicked him off. They found him and kicked because he was still terrible. And then the next year he went as, um, as an American golfer, Gene Paycecki, with a mustache and a hat and these shades. And he was still terrible. And they, and they kicked him up, but he was practicing all the time, you know, and his wife supported him actually. It was just a great story. And the film with, we're very lucky. We got Mark Rylance is going to play. We start shooting a couple of weeks. Mark Rylance is going to play um, Morris Flickcroft and we got Sally Hawkins playing his wife. And, um, but he just went, he never, never made any money out of golf. He never, but he just had a, he had a love of the game. And um, he was like, why not? Why not? Uh, I'm not doing any harm. I just love the game. I want to play it. So if I, I love that because I, you, you do it a lot the idler. You go, why don't you take up the violin or snooker or, you know, uh, <laughs> wine making? You don't have to be the best. Morris Flickoff had this thing. He goes, why don't we celebrate losers? In a, in a golf tournament, there's one winner and there's 149 losers. What about them? That's what he said. He's got, he's, so anyway, so that has a... Um, that has a philosophical... Yeah. ...argument uh, um, behind it. Now, Simon, we're sort of getting towards questions, but maybe we could hear your rap. So this is a bit... It's a bit in the book where... Um, um, Murdin has to... Has to uh, in the Dark Ages at the beginning, his, his magical staff called Thundarian gets thrown down a well by his, by, by his um, enemy. So when he's in the future, he has to go to this well, which is in the old well shopping center. So there's a big shopping center around this old well that used to be in this beautiful wood. But the well is still there and it's like a wishing well. And, and so he has to go into the shopping center, but there's these security guards stop him. And um, Rose, who's the girl, has this idea to say that he's a ra he's Hey, this is MC Wizard, you know, he's a famous guy. And he just wants to get a photo by the, you know, I'm going to take a photo of him by this well. And they go, oh, you're, uh, you're a rapper, are you? Uh, the security guard says, and he goes, well, let's hear one of your songs then and I'll let you in. So then Rose, the girl goes, oh shit, you know, this is going to go bad. And then, and then Murden goes, no, no, I, I know. Uh, oh, that's right. So he says to her, what's a rap? And she says, it's a sort of fast uh, rhyme about something you like, you know, it's uh, uh, um, Elizabeth wants control of my camera. She's not going to get it. Should I decline? I would decline immediately. <laughs> anyway, so he has to do, um, uh, he goes, I'll do a rap. Rose is panicking. Um, so, so before he does the rap, he says, uh, he danced with complete abandon as if no one was watching. It was a bizarre sight. And then he started to sing. Well, it was sort of singing. The hog whistle root will make a grumpy owl hoot. Never sip catnip before a long trip. The pepper seed and maca weed will make you feel the need for speed. <laughs> uh, remarkably, because of its quick delivery and staccato rhythm, and if you forgot the subject matter, it did sound a bit like a rap. Murdin flung his arms around like a madman 
trying to catch flies with his hands, then launched into the second verse. The juniper shiggle will get the in a giggle. Be busy with Thin Lizzy if you want to feel dizzy. But the ground ivy trick will make thee feel sick. And the gum tree bush will get thy mush in a hush. The white willow bark will have thee up with the lark. Never let it be forgotten that tormental makes thee feel rotten. Or I'll make thee forget it with my ground ivy nepeta. And with that, Murdin sank down on one knee, head bowed, breathing heavily due to the physical exertion of the performance. It was like watching Michael Flatley at the end of a particularly vigorous river dance. <laughs> so, if you'll notice, thank well you. Well done, brilliant. So all that, they're, they're all herbs with their, with their counterpart. Um, so hog whistle root um, will make a grumpy owl hoot. So hog whistle roots used to make you feel happy. And uh, pepper seed and maca weed uh, used to suppress hunger. You know, so they okay, all. Okay, so it's it's a it's what you would call a didactic poem. It's a, it's a it herb has, has, has a purpose. It's an educational yes, poem. Yes. Um, oh, juniper, a rap. The juniper shiggle, the juniper gin, will make you feel the need to giggle. So it all has a. It's about herbs and their side effects, <laughs> and it's a um, dark ages um, uh, poem, I suppose. That he, that that again, it's that theme of going. That was, you know, a sort of almost shaman-like song that might have been sung around a campfire. And it's like a rap now. So, you know, we are all one and always were. We are all one. Now, Victoria, should we go to some questions? 